Welcome everyone to this act of worship in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we begin together, let's be quiet as we recognise that God is among us here. All you works of God, all you mighty heavens, all you angels of light, all you saints in glory, worship and praise your maker. People young and old, children and women and men, all who do heaven's will, all who the Lord loves, worship and praise your maker. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you do not need our praise. The world itself tells of your glory. Sunrise and birdsong, the ruggedness of landscape, the randomness of rain. Beauty for the eye, nourishment for the body, music for the soul. These all speak of your goodness. These honour your name. You do not need our praise. Other places can do it better, with finer music or fewer words, with centuries of tradition or buildings of rare beauty. Other people can do it better, where two or three are gathered who live in poverty or under threat and who, despite all that oppresses them, rejoice to be called your own. What can we add, by way of magnificence or testimony, when these are more eloquent? You do not need our praise, but we need to praise you. It is the yearning, the restlessness which you have planted in us. It is our desire for a true home and unconditional acceptance that brings us to praise you. All the rumours we have heard about you are true. You love you forgive, you transform, you call, and you know us. You perceive what in us needs to be loved, what in us needs to be forgiven, what in us needs to be changed. And so we come to you to bring ourselves, asking for that grace, forgiveness, and transformation. And in the quiet, we pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. These are the words of Jesus. They are strong and true, so believe them. I have come, he says, that you may have life in all its fullness. Go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Come, each one, and follow me. Amen.
Immediately, Jesus made, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land. It was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I wonder how many of us have had to use Zoom in this pandemic time. Some of us learning it happily and some uh, less happily, less willingly, I suspect. Zoom has been a wonderful thing. It's allowed us to communicate with one another, but it can also be incredibly frustrating. I've had conversations with people where everything's going well at one minute and then either they freeze in the most unflattering of positions or their voice becomes bah, 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 bah. and I have no idea what they were trying to say. I know there was a message they were trying to give me, but I have no idea what it was. In those kind of moments, we need help, we need wisdom, we need guidance, somebody who knows what the message was. So imagine for a moment, you're one of Jesus' disciples, you've traveled with him for a while, you've seen incredible things, but you're still wondering, what does all this mean? What does it mean to follow this man? How does it mean to be his disciple? How do I live the kind of life he's called me to? And then Jesus tells you to get onto a boat. You do. Land is soon far away. The wind and the waves are battering you. And you wonder, how have we ended up here? Then something incredible happens. And through it, Jesus shows you again what it means to be his disciple. You see, the feeding of the 5,000 that Ros spoke to us last week about is just before this story of walking on the water, a moment of incredible importance. The disciples are worried about food and Jesus teaches them if they want to see an incredible miracle, they're going to have to do it. Jesus' power is at work, but they are going to have to do the hard work. They do. And 5,000 men and however many women and children are fed. 12 baskets of leftover are collected. This is a miracle that's about vocation. It's about what Jesus' disciples both then and now are called to do, to feed those who are hungry, to share the abundance of God's grace. But then the disciples go on in the boat. They're shown there how they go about living this kind of life that they're called to. Where do they turn for help and support and power? Jesus walks across the water to them. They panic. Jesus says, don't worry, it's me. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come, come here, come to me, come to your friend, come to your master, come to your teacher, come to your God. And that's the very heart of this. When those disciples wonder how they sustain the life Jesus has called to them, he answers them, come. When you and I wonder how we can carry on, how we live the life of God's people, how we follow the, goal, the call that God has placed upon us, Jesus answers, come. Come to your saviour, come to me. In everything that took place on that lake, this is the crucial bit, I think. Christ calls to his beloved disciples, come. And firstly, I think he says, come with your fear. 
The disciples are scared, they've been in this boat a good while, a storm has come up, they're battered by the waves, they're afraid, afraid that the water will overcome them, afraid that the boat will sink and they'll drown, they're scared. And at that time in the Jewish world, there was a fear of the sea, a fear of the raging sea because it was seen as a symbol of chaos, of evil, of an uncontrollable force that couldn't be tamed. So here in the boat, it feels like they'll be defeated by this force. It feels like they might not escape. It feels like everything might just fall apart and they're scared. And then in the middle of all their fear, Jesus calls to them, come. Even in their fear, they can learn what it means to follow. Even in their fear, they can encounter the blessing of God and be changed by it. My first attempt at preaching came when I was a first year student at Cliff College 20 odd years ago. It was at a Baptist church in Withenshaw and I'd agreed to do it back at college. And then the moment came and I found myself in the vestry absolutely terrified, thinking, what on earth am I doing here? Why on earth are people going to listen to me? And the sermon wasn't brilliant. Um, but somehow in the midst of that fear, I sensed God's presence. And that was enough to transform that situation for me. There are times when all of us are afraid. There are times when we're scared. There are times when we find ourselves in places of fear that leave us wondering what on earth is going to happen. When marriages fail, redundancy happens, children become ill, we become ill, our friends become ill, debts grow, the family can't be fed, loved ones die and we're afraid. And yet somehow in those moments, God calls to us, come, come with all that fear and find grace. And for those of us who can't yet bear to leave the boat, Jesus walks across the water to you, not giving up, but waiting and calling and loving. Come with your fear. But more than that, not only calling his disciples to come with their fear, Jesus calls them to come with their failure. Peter sees Jesus walking on the water, walking on that that can't be controlled, master over chaos, master over the evil below, and he wants a bit of that for himself. So when Jesus calls to them, Peter says, Lord, let me come. And Jesus says, come. He gets out of the boat, but he fails. When he saw the wind, when he felt the waves, he's afraid and he begins to sink. But Jesus does not leave him. He reaches out his hand and catches him. In this moment of failure, Peter is closer to his Lord than he ever was in the boat. He's taken that step over the side. He's attempting to follow, to go where he is called to be, and he fails. But despite all that, the hand of his Lord is closer than it has ever been before. You and I know what it is to fail. We know what it is to be wrong. And yet the truth is, in those moments of failure, we're often closer to the Lord than in those moments when we stay safely in our boats. And if we fail, the hand of the Lord reaches out and catches us. I'm going to make a dreadful admission to you this morning. I failed my first driving test. When I was 17, I took the test and I messed a few things up and I was devastated. I didn't really want anyone knowing this. And yet when it was all over, my driving instructor, Les, didn't say, well, you had your chance. That's it. We're done. He said, OK, well, Monday morning, we're back on the road and we'll get this sorted. Failure is not always a bad thing. You wouldn't know that I failed my first driving test because I'm such an excellent driver now. Peter got out of that boat and he failed, but his Lord held on to him and still called, come. Christ still calls, come to you and to me with all our failures and our mistakes. He calls us onward to that journey of discipleship with him. And if we fail, he will not leave us, but will reach out and take our hand before the waves overcome us. Perhaps he'll speak the words of rebuke. Why did you doubt? But that's to remind us that with him, all things are possible and we can fulfill what we are called to through his grace. Come with your failure. And yet there's more. In the call of Christ, there is more. Peter got out of the boat and for a moment, a fleeting moment perhaps, he was there on the surface of the water, doing what he'd been called to, standing on the waves and walking to his Lord. For a moment he was there with faith in Jesus, walking on the water. 
And that moment is important because for many of us, there are moments when we feel we're in the right place. Moments where we feel that we're doing what God has called us to. Moments where we feel we've responded to that gracious call and we find ourselves in the right place. Christ calls to his people, come, come for, to find those moments of inspiration, those moments of clarity, those moments of vision, those moments of certainty, fleeting as they might be, to allow us to see beyond ourselves and into all that God has for us. Come, calls Christ. You with little faith, you with great faith, you who desire a deeper faith, come and know grace and love and power and even for a moment, walk on the water. We are called to trust God, to trust in the way that he leads us and guides us, to trust in the way that he shapes us and moulds us to be his people, to enable us to get out of the boat and for those moments to stand on the water. In my family there is one of us who hates diversions on the roads and it's my mum. She hates the idea of travelling somewhere and then being diverted off the road that she knows into somewhere else. And this happened just the other day. She'd gone to Elmsmere Port to see our Auntie Joyce. And on the way back, the M56 was closed. And so obviously there was a moment of panic and the diversion. But a few moments later, the sat-nav had a new route. And while it wasn't the expected route, it took longer. It took her home. As hard as it was, she had to trust the one who knew the way. God is at work in you and in me to lead us. Sometimes the way is hard and challenging. Sometimes it takes longer than we would think, but it is the way to life. He calls to you and to me, come. Come out of the boat with our faith and know his grace in our lives. Know the abundance of grace that he offers to us because only then can we hold it out to the world. Come with your faith. Come, Christ calls, to disciples in a boat 2,000 years ago, and to you and to me, come with your fear. Come with your failure. Come with your faith. And walk on the water. Amen. Let us pray. O oh, great and generous God, graciously set your eye this day on those who know their need of you through pain, through trouble, through grief, through their own fault. Nurse the weak, bandage the broken, console the desolate, 
forgive the penitent. O Christ, who calls us to come, graciously set your eye this day on those who have no need of you. Through pride, through disappointment, through doubt, through the failure of false friends. Soften the hardened heart, confront the arrogant will, uncover hidden depths and the truth that sets us free. O Holy Spirit, breath of God, move among us this day. Open us to the beauty of the earth, that we may become its servants. Open us to the wonder of life, that we may recognise an angel at every corner. Open us to the storehouse of your grace, that we may be made new for Jesus' sake. And now in quiet, we bring our prayers for the world for our communities and for ourselves before Almighty God. The Lord hears our prayer. The Lord calls us to follow, to transform the world in the grace that we have received. May we trust him and follow that path. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the God who called us into the joyous light of this new day call us to the guiding light of eternity. God above us, God beneath us, God behind us, God before us, God in quietness, God in danger, God in heart a friend and stranger. Bless and keep you this day and forevermore. Amen.